So today's speaker is Don Kretschmer. I heard him speak a couple of years ago at a North American Lake Management Society uh, meeting that was in Burlington and he gave a great talk. And at the time I wrote it down and I said, oh, this would be really good for our members and for um, our conference. And it took me a couple of years, but eventually I, I tracked him down and um, asked him to come and he uh, said he would. So he is here today. Uh, to give this presentation, do green watersheds support blue lakes? Hopefully you got a chance to read his bio, um, but he and I, we almost crossed paths at Cornell, but not quite. Uh, he, I won't tell you who was first, who got through first. Um, well, I will, it wasn't me. But anyway, so we didn't quite cross paths at Cornell, but we, uh, I know full well the program he went through at Cornell in natural resources because I did the same thing. And then he went on to the University of Wisconsin in Madison where he got a master's degree in water resource management. And he has a ton of experience, has worked throughout Maine and New Hampshire and really across the country. He uh, worked closely with a lot of Maine lake associations in helping them sort out their water resource issues. So without any further ado, um, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it on to you, Don. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I think you've got everything in my bio that um, that's relevant here. Um, I live just over the border in New Hampshire, um, uh, and I'm affiliated with my local lake association here, Lake Wentworth, um, and I've been working as a volunteer for them for 22 years, and I'm sure many of you are in the same position I am that, you know, once you're in, you're in, and uh, I expect I'll be in for quite some time, so. Uh, 22 years is just the beginning. I'm, I'm like one of the short timers on our Lake Association. So, but it's a, it's a labor of love, love and uh, um, you know, I'm glad to do it. So I'm gonna share my screen here and then we'll get going. I'll take a second. Some of the controls are over the top of other things. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we definitely see your screen. Um, here we go. Yep, that looks there we good. Go. Does that work? And I would, I would encourage you, as Susan said, if you don't want to see me, um, there's no point in that. Um, um, okay. Then. Uh, uh, send me into the into the background. So um, I decided to, to, I had to get green in the title here. Um, so I um, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the green watersheds support blue lakes and the green is a nod to St. Patrick's Day. And I appreciate that you're all uh, here on this really nice day that is also, a, you know, kind of a fun holiday with, without any real obligations. Um, so uh, I appreciate that you're here. Um, I'll try to stay on time so uh, you can get on to the rest of the daylight savings time uh, uh, hours that, uh, that were given to us this past weekend. Um, bonus points in the chat, if anybody uh, can, can uh, identify where this was taken. Um, the biggest hint is that it was in the state of Maine. And uh, so you can feel free to uh, think about that for a few minutes. And, uh, and uh, if you can think about where that is, um, um, that'd be great. So this work came out of um, some work that I did um, originally for Lake Wentworth, but it's it's work that I do for watersheds all over the place. And, uh, you know, one thing that that uh, came clear to me um, as I worked on, you know, more and more and more watersheds in New England is that, you know, that the quality of the lakes really depended on how much forest there was, how much intact forest there was in the watershed. Um, and, you uh, that got me to thinking about, you know, sort of what, what things were like in the past and what they might be like in the future. And that's sort of all weaved together um, is sort of the, the origins of this talk. So what I'm gonna talk about today, um, I'll talk a little bit just because I, you know, I never know exactly what audience I have, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about why forests are important to reservoirs, lakes and ponds. Um, and you know, sort of what the what the underlying issue is, and I'll give you a hint. It's probably going to be 
some sort of nutrient issue. Um, I'll, I'll go through a bit of history. I've collected a little bit of a history of uh, sort of New England, um, a bit of modeling, very, very light. Um, um, an example of a project I did that um, simulated some forestry uh, for a uh, water utility. And then I'll give you some things to think about to, to leave here. So what shapes water quality? Um, there's a whole variety of things that this sort of reflect in the lake um, in terms of what we have for water quality, you know, chemistry, geology, size of watershed. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple of them, um, one of them being the activities on the land, the history, um, and sort of, you know, what's what potentially could be happening in the future. There are a lot of other elements, um, you know, that, that, um, that uh, dictate what we have for water quality, like the aquatic community, uh, the weather and the climate, um, all really interesting topics, all things that um, we could cover in another talk or another whole series of talks. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about them, but um, I'm gonna try to stick to sort of the activities on the land and the, and the history. So this is the classic slide. You've probably seen it before. Or many of you have, you know, phosphorus, it's the most important nutrient for lakes. It's what we try to manage and it sort of determines how green a lake is. Uh, sort of the amount of phosphorus is um, directly um, proportional to the, the amount of algae that a lake will grow. It's the middle number on a bag of fertilizer. Um, if you're anywhere in a lake watershed, which most of us probably are, or even a river watershed, uh, that number should be zero. There's plenty of natural phosphorus in our soils and uh, there's no need to add more. Um, which phosphorus grows algae? Which algae can reduce water clarity, deplete dissolved oxygen, and may result in blooms of toxic algae? And an increasingly uh, big issue uh, in New England lakes. This is a lake um, that unfortunately last summer uh, bloomed. It's also a water supply. Um, it turns out that that was a really big issue. Um, this is in New England. It's one that I got called in on um, uh, once it bloomed. And uh, my, my preference is to work on lakes prior to blooming to avoid this kind of situation. Um, uh, but, you know, this is one that happened and they needed help and, uh, you know, we tried to do our best, but I, I'm, I'm much more, um, much more interested in helping out with a lot of the proactive stuff ahead of time uh, to make sure you never get to this situation. So this is how we kind of figured out that phosphorus was, it was an issue. Um, this was a study done by Schindler, um, a colleague up in Canada. Um, they split the lake in half, added nitrogen and carbon to this half, added nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus to this half, and this half bloomed. Um, not being satisfied with sort of Schindler's experiment um, with my daughter when she was a little kid, uh, we took some water out of our local lake, um, put lawn fertilizer in one jar, left the other one, uh, without anything in it, put them in the windowsill for two weeks, and this was the difference. So it was a pretty clear demonstration that uh, a little bit of fertilizer turns the lake green. So where does this phosphorus come from? A um, whole bunch of natural sources um, in a natural lake, but not they're not large sources. Um, the forest, whatever runs off the land, um, there's some atmospheric um, um, phosphorus that comes in with dust fall and rainfall, um, typically not a large amount. Um, there's resuspension and release from the sediments, although in an unimpacted kind of pristine lake, that's usually a very small number. And then there's sort of the locally controlled sources, which come from everything from, from you know, cleared land to, to residential land, uh, houses to roads, um, septic systems, and all those things. And these are the these are the, the, the buckets of phosphorus that we can control. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, this natural source um, as, as we go forward and how if much of your watershed only has this natural cover, um, you're likely to be better off in terms of water quality. So the natural watershed um, uh, for much of Maine is forest. Um, so, you know, if we weren't here, um, much of the, 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 the landscape would be forested. I think right now Maine is at about something short, just short of 90% um, uh, forest, um, but that wasn't always the case. So 
these are some lakes that I've worked on um, in the last 10 years or so. And, you know, what I wanted to show here, if you look at the background, you know, to keep it in simple terms, you don't even have to worry about the numbers. Um, you know, as you go up the scale, the lake is progressively greener. And these fall, fall out in a pretty direct line between, you know, the, the, there's, there's quite a bit of forest in this watershed, a little bit less in this one, a little bit less in this one, and then the least amount in this one. And, you know, the, the amount of development um, associated with these lakes is, you know, low development, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And, you know, it's a pretty clear illustration that, you know, the less forest there is in the watershed as a percentage, um, and the more development there is, the greener the lake is likely to be. Um, each of these lakes have had done some watershed planning to try to reverse where they're at. And I would certainly encourage that. Um, likewise with streams, you know, less forest and more development typically leads to poorer water quality. And so, so if you get you know, less than 10% of the watershed developed, you're likely to have really good quality in the streams. And as we know, the streams are what feed our lakes. So um, really important to have um, you know, high quality streams coming into the lakes. Um, and uh, um, as you get more and more developed, like up here, we're, we're at about you know, 60 to 100% developed, which would be similar to, to a downtown area, um, typically stream water quality in those situations is very poor. And likewise, the lake downstream would, would be expected to have poor water quality. So as the, as the song goes, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And um, so these are two secchi disc readings um, in different lakes. Um, and clearly the one that, that uh, is clear is probably the one that is most desired. So history matters. Um, makes a difference, our, our, our lakes have been around longer than we have, they remember things. Um, um, I'm not quite old enough, even though I'm maybe a little older than Susan, I'm not quite old enough to, to do field work with a bow tie on, like these gentlemen uh, back at the turn of the century, or the last century, but uh, um, this is the way they used to do things. Um, um, we're a little more casual these days. Um, like I said, the lakes remember longer than we do, um, but history tends to repeat itself. So there's some lessons that we can learn from, you know, taking a look at, at some of the history of lakes. And the way we look at that is through, through a combination of, um, you know, looking at old photographs, old aerial photographs, um, uh, historical accounts, um, and the sediments of the lake, which have been accumulating since um, the last glaciation. So glaciers uh, came across uh, all of New England, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, it included, um, you know, Maine and, and New Hampshire were completely underneath the, underneath the ice cover. So we kind of had a, a clean slate um, once the, the glaciers receded and the forest grew up. So, and then not a lot happened for about 9,500 years until you know, a European settlement happened. And then all of a sudden a lot happened. So we had you know, much of Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont and Massachusetts was logged uh, for mast and timbers. Um, huge log drives. I think we can't even imagine the scale of it, um, you know, in our current context. But, you know, something like 90% of uh, New Hampshire was cleared. Uh, probably a similar amount of at least southern and central Maine was cleared as well. Um, Around the, the 1800 to 1810 to 1840, New England was the wool capital of the world. And in fact, there were more, uh, more sheep than there were people in Maine. Um, same thing in New Hampshire. Um, you know, I, I like to, to describe sheep as uh, lawnmowers with legs. Um, you know, this would have been the landscape through, you know, over a lot of um, our lake watersheds clearly very, very different than what we have now. And it, and it turns out that you can see that still in the sediment records. Um, by 1840, uh, you know, many people moved west because they were tired of rocks. Um, they realized that there was land out there that didn't have rocks and it was a lot easier to farm. Um, if you look at this picture, you know, a little different than the one before, um, all, all the black dots have moved west as well. I don't know if the 
if the people followed the sheep or the sheep followed the people. But um, for sure, the sheep were, you know, largely, you know, the sheep farming largely left New England and the forests were allowed to grow back. And we still see, you know, on the landscape, we still see vestiges of those days, you know, the, the stone walls through the middle of really big woods. Um, and, um, you know, abandoned, you know, um, foundations from old farms and, uh, and barns, you know, uh, in the middle of the woods. Um, so things were very different back then. And like I said, our lakes remember that. You can still see that in the sediment record. Um, second logging happened, you know, around the turn of the last century. And, um, you know, that was equally as dramatic. It didn't last quite as long because kind of sheep didn't follow that. Um, but the whole landscape was pretty much cleared again. These are a couple, couple of scenes from the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Um, pretty shocking. And, you know, in addition to having logging, they had some enormous fires related to the slash that was left on the ground. Um, it dried up and, and burned and uh, um, quite a dramatic uh, change in the landscape. Um, here's a couple shots from Maine from around that time period um, on the top. Um, there's some logs in the Kennebec on the left, top left. Um, and sort of in the, you know, the bottom left picture is sort of a picture of the cleared landscape with a lake in the background. And uh, you can imagine that, you know, the water quality coming off of that slope is much different than what it would have been um, when it was forested. Um, there's another picture from, uh, you know, near Moosehead Lake around 1996. You know, clear cuts like this still happen. Uh, they're not, you know, certainly not as frequent as they used to be, um, but they still happen. Well, this is a way to kind of illustrate kind of where the forest, uh, forest went uh, uh, over time. Um, if you look in the 1620s, you know, all of New England was old growth, growth forest, but by the time you get to 1990, um, pretty much all of the old growth forest had been cut down in New England. Um, so we were, you know, all on second and tertiary growth forest now, um, the forest we have, there's virtually no old growth left. So, you know, the, the message there is that everything's been logged at least once. And so here's a typical lake view around the turn of the last century. This happens to be right near where I live. Um, I was out for a walk uh, today, and I will assure you that every place that you can see a pasture here or a field is now woods. Um, and the landscape, you know, all of the, the, uh, the trees have grown back. And uh, that has changed what we have for water quality as a result. Um, there's other things that have knocked down trees in, in uh, um, New Hampshire and Maine. Um, the Hurricane of 38 is one example that came through New Hampshire and caught part of Maine. Um, there was an enormous amount of, of tree damage. And in fact, you can still see the signal of that in lake sediments. You can see where a lot of sediment came into the lakes and right after the, the hurricane in 1938. But what are some of the characteristics that are important of the secondary or tertiary growth forest? You know, it's, it's not quite as diverse as the old growth. Um, the underlying soils may not be as thick or fertile, and a lot of that is related to when they were logged, there was a lot of erosion. So a lot of those soils ended up in the valley bottoms, and they're not on the hillsides anymore. And in fact, you know, in the, in the White Mountains um, and a lot, of our, a lot of our hilltops, they were eroded completely after they, you know, were cleared and then burned. And that's why we have, you know, sort of above tree line areas with nothing but rock on the top of a lot of our hills. Um, there's no really old trees, you know, 100 years would be a pretty old tree, 150 would be really old. Um, there may be some non-native species, a lot of, a lot of uh, the, the areas that were logged were planted back with, with species that aren't native to here. Um, and many of the trees are the same age, and what that means for forestry is that if there's logging to happen, um, you may have to take them all. Um, you know, or you may, you may end up taking them all because they're all, they all come to market at the same time come to market age. So current, current practices in Maine for, for logging and timber management, I mean, there's still a, there's a variety of things. It's not the traditional clear cut, although large clear cuts still happen. Um, there's small clear cuts, there's selective cutting, there's thinning. Um, there's usually a bunch of infrastructure. It's the lower right panel will show, you know, 
a bunch of skitter roads and landings and things like that that are associated with the logging too. Um, if those aren't restored afterwards, they can be a continuing source of nutrients and, and soil loss. But if you look at the upper upper right panel, this is this was logged about five or six years before this. This picture was taken and it's grown back quite a bit. So there is a recovery that happens fairly rapidly if it's allowed to happen. So what might all this, you know, have this meant for lakes in the past and what, what might it mean in the future? So this is like sort of a culmination of all the, all the work I did uh, over the years on, or I've done over the years on Lake Wentworth. There's coring data in here. I think the important thing to do is sort of follow the track of the line here. And sort of in the 1760s, if we look, you know, Lake Wentworth was likely, you know, you know the blue stage, oligotrophic, low nutrients, uh, really high transparency, um, and very, very little algal growth. Um, as we went through the first logging, um, and this is all, you know, borne out in the sediments, sediment cores that we've taken, um, I think phosphorus concentrations got really high for quite a period of time. And this would be the sheep period um, where the, the you know, lake was, was purely uh, uh, pasture and sheep. Um, I think we were probably, you know, if not, if not there, we were close to eutrophic at that stage. Um, then the forest recovered um, and then the second logging happened. And we had a period of time where water quality was probably poor again. And we didn't have the sheep, so it didn't get quite as bad. Um, if you and then things recovered and so so when I hear people talk about you know how good were the you know the good old days it isn't like it used to be well if you look at this this timeline you know this is sort of the period where people are remembering the 20s and 30s and 40s um, they're remembering what water quality was like then and and in fact it probably isn't as good as it was back then but nobody's alive right now who's old enough to remember when it was probably a lot poorer and there's some lessons there for where we might be going in the future. Um, this little blip here is uh, the hurricane of 38. Um, we can actually see that in the sediments and, uh, and we can infer what that might've looked like in the lake. Um, and then this slope up here is basically modern development, you know, where we've, we've taken the, the, the forest that's grown back and started to build on it. And, um, and sort of then we enter the sort of data collection phase. There's a little bit here that we actually have data for, um, water quality data, and you can see it kind of bounces around a little bit. This was sort of the big building boom when a lot of camps were built on the lake and water quality wasn't great for a few years there. There was a lot of big developments and um, um, likely a lot of erosion associated with that. Um, this is where we're at today, um, still pretty close to the blue stage. And this is kind of where we want to be with watershed planning. And then this last trajectory is sort of what it might look like in the future. And if, you, if you'll, you'll notice, if we took, so we did a build out analysis where we basically took the current growth rates of, our, of the towns in our watershed and said, all right, if these current growth rates and using current zoning, um, if everything that, that could be built was built, what would water quality look like? And in fact, it looks very similar to what it looked like back when it was cleared. So that's sort of a call for action. Like, I'm not sure we want to go back there. Um, and um, uh, we need to maybe do things a little differently, build with a small footprint and uh, be really careful. Okay, I can't quite see what this slide says, but uh, anyway, uh, pros and cons, that's what it is. This is pros and cons of sort of timber management in a watershed. So the pros are, you know, harvest may generate money to keep land in current ownership. I mean, a lot of landowners have, you know, have a lot of land and, and this is the only way they can generate any money off of it. Um, and if the taxes are high, um, that may be a way that they can, can keep, keep the land in, in current ownership and not fragment it. Um, it could create some forest diversity, particularly if it was planted after the last logging. It could benefit early successional habitat, um, which um, is, you know, really attractive to some wildlife species like moose. Um, can reduce fire risk, particularly if there's a stand that's not healthy. Um, can pr promote regeneration. Um, and, you know, forests in Maine and New Hampshire provide jobs and billions of dollars to the economy of Maine. 
some of the cons. Um, <clears throat> so forestry can increase sedimentation, erosion, nutrient loading, and stream temperatures. Um, increased runoff, particularly right after, after um, the, uh, the logging happens. Um, it can decrease base flow, which um, means that more water runs off, less goes into the ground. So in the summer, the streams tend to go dry quicker. It may create an aesthetic impact. Um, we've all seen sort of cleared hillsides and um, that isn't the look that we uh, necessarily associate with the kind of pristine lake environments. Um, you can change high value habitat. I have a slide coming up that I'll, that I'll show a little bit more about that. Um, it can also lead to increased public access through development. I think we all know examples of places that have been logged and then split up for development afterwards once there's a kind of a road network through it. Um, can result in um, invasive or inferior forest species um, that come in after, after logging. Um, and also, you know, I, I don't know that this is necessarily a con, but, you know, to the extent that forestry um, runs at odds with water quality in lakes, um, the lakes provide jobs and billions of dollars to the economy of Maine. So clearly, you know, you have two things that, that, um, that provide jobs and billions of dollars to the economy. I think that um, it's way better to work together to try to come up with a, an outcome that's suitable for both um, than, to, than to fight against each other. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, shorefront forestry, which may be near and dear to those of you who are on this call that um, actually live on the shorefront. Um, you know, and sort of this, these are the actions that individual homeowners make relative to the, to the forest on their property. Um, everything from removing leaves underneath the trees to removing the trees themselves. So here's an extreme example um, from a lake I worked on. Um, this rock is that rock. So um, this was all forested, this, this shorefront, um, it was completely cleared. Um, not legally so, um, but nonetheless, you couldn't put the trees back once they were cut down. Um, it was hard to, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. And uh, there were some pretty significant water quality issues related to that site until it, they spent millions of dollars, literally, to, uh, to replant trees and redo the drainage after they destroyed it. Um, so this is the classic practice that I see in a lot of lakefront properties where they continually, you cut back all the underbrush and leave the big trees and then continually rake the leaves out from underneath those trees. And so this was a windstorm that happened on the lake I was working on. And on this property, 600 feet of waterfront, 18 trees came down. Um, and as you can see what happened after years and years of taking the, the leaf litter out and removing all the underbrush, um, the amount of soil left that, that had organic soil that they actually, could, actually the trees could root in was about two inches thick. And they just peeled right up, you know, tree after tree after tree in one windstorm. There were properties on either side of this property that were intact forest with, with a duff layer and shrub, shrubs. There wasn't any damage at all. Um, it was just where it had been for years and years, the understory had been cleared out and the leaves had been all raked. Um, it made for a really unstable situation for the trees that were left. Um, well, then there's the, you know, the, the thought, well, I have a nice lawn. I really like this. I really like my lawn. Um, you know, I like to make the point that there's many, many times more phosphorus uh, that run off of a lawn uh, than, that, or many times, you know, more phosphorus in lawn runoff than, than in forest. Um, it can be, you know, eight to 10 times as much. Um, and it's even more if you add fertilizer to the lawn. So even the best maintained lawn will, will export more phosphorus to the lake than an intact forest. So um, really important to kind of minimize lawn area uh, on the lakefront. Here's the big issue for lake. We look at phosphorus export, how much phosphorus comes off the land from a forest. You see, these are pretty low numbers to barren land right after logging. Um, these are much, much higher numbers by an order of magnitude. Um, and then off of a lawn area, again, you know, by an order of magnitude higher. So just changing from forest to developed land uses makes a big, big difference. And if you do that over the, the whole watershed, you can expect that water quality will be impacted. 
really, really important to keep for us. So I'm gonna show one example and then I'll take some questions. I think we're doing pretty well on time here. <clears throat> so I was asked by the city of Keene, New Hampshire um, to take a look at their, their reservoir system, the Roaring Brook Reservoir System. They'd had very little water quality work done on it, but they've owned it and owned the reservoirs and the watersheds for the better part of the last hundred years. Um, so the way this came about is somebody on their committee, on the, on the, the city's committee, um, said, hey, we got all that timber in the watershed. Why don't we cut it down to make some money? Um, so the question they had for us was, can we cut the timber and protect water quality? And the answer is, well, you know, it depends. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that. So here's the watershed. Now the yellow line is the, uh, the boundary of, that the city owns. So they own a good portion of this watershed, which is really important because uh, um, uh, they, they're allowed to control their own destiny. So uh, they own 62% 60, of the watershed, um, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, one of the difficulties they have is that the, um, the watershed is not in Keene. And so Keene takes the water from that watershed, but they don't, you know, the, the watershed is not in their, in their city. And so there becomes a little, little bit of a, uh, you know, a tension between, you know, how can they tell us what to do in, you know, when, when we don't even get water from, uh, from the system. So, and I'm sure that tension happens elsewhere. Um, and I know it happens in, you know, lakes in New Hampshire and Maine. So here's the important part of, of characteristics of that watershed. Right now it's 95% forest. Um, phosphorus is very low, uh, very low chlorophyll A. There's no history of blooms in this watershed, um, you know, in, in the reservoirs. Um, really high quality water requires very minimal treatment, if any. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that's really, really valuable to the city of Keene. That's the primary water supply for Keene, 2 million gallons a day. So that's 23,000 people get their water from this system. Um, here's a look, you know, one of the first things that, uh, that the city did, and I think it was probably one of the more important ones is they actually hired a forester before they decided to start cutting, cutting trees. And they came up with a plan to, to cut trees and figure out exactly what they had. Um, so this is kind of a forest map of the forest owned lands. Um, Incidentally to the, uh, the, um, the forestry mapping, they mapped habitat. And it turns out that a lot of this uh, old growth or older growth forest, um, the older forests are also really high valuable um, habitat for some species. Um, some of the highest ranked habitat in New Hampshire is in this watershed because it hasn't been basically touched in a hundred years. So here's the, here's the, 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 you know, the bottom line. You don't have to read all these numbers. The only one you really need to read is the bottom one. Six million bucks was kind of what, a little over $6 million was what the, what the timber inventory was worth on the watershed. And that raised some eyebrows in the, in the city. They're like, wow, boy, that'll solve a lot of our problems. And um, I think that, you know, some of the public works folks said, hold on a minute. That may also create some problems. And that's where they kind of brought me uh, in to, to try to uh, shed some light on that. So here's a kind of a summary slide of what happened uh, when, we, when I simulated a 15 year cut. So it's basically taking the watershed, all the forest that they could cut and splitting it up into 15 different blocks and cutting a different block every year and running that water through the watershed, letting that block recover over a period of time and then cutting the next block the next year. And um, so there's a bunch of assumptions that went into this analysis, but what it clearly showed was that water quality right now is pretty good. And as they start to cut, it gets worse and worse. And that happens for a period of time. Um, while the cutting's going on, it gets better depending on which some watershed they're cutting and where it is in the, in the, uh, in the landscape. And then it gets worse again. And then once the cutting is finished at year 15, it starts to recover again and eventually goes back to where they, where they were. But clearly during most of the years that they were proposing to cut timber, water quality would have been unacceptable. And it's very, very likely they would have had 
algal blooms and cyanobacteria blooms where they didn't have them before. And it turned out that for them, that was an unacceptable risk and they decided not to do anything right now. They may come back with a different plan to, to selectively harvest or do very small patches that can you know, avoid some of the water quality impacts. And I think uh, you know, that's something that'd be worth looking at again. But um, you know, this scenario where they, you know, over the course of 15 years, clear cut the, the watershed was, uh, it turned out not to be a winner in terms of water quality. So a few take home message, messages, and then we'll have some time for some questions. Um, this is something that I, you know, I tell a lot of lake associations, um, forests are the best BMP we have. I wish we could develop a BMP that could trap as much phosphorus on the landscape as an intact forest does. I don't think we're there yet. I mean, basically by leaving them alone, um, they do their job and they continue to do their job. Um, so I, you know, I think they're the, the, the best BMP that we have on the landscape. Um, no cut management may protect water quality now, um, but it might increase the risk of fire and pest outbreak in the future. That's something to think about. You know, if a forest is sort of um, getting older and it wasn't a, you know, necessarily a healthy stand to begin with, um, if you have pest issues, um, if you have drought issues, um, there may be reasons other than you know, just water quality reasons to, to do some management in the forest to improve its health and make it function better in the future uh, for water quality. Um, timber, timber harvest may increase nutrient sediments and algal productivity in the short term. I think that's a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear relationship there. Um, I think there are ways of doing it uh, very, very carefully. And I think it's incumbent on all of us who are sort of have a, our stakeholders for lakes to make sure that timber harvest that happens in our purview is, is done correctly and, uh, and carefully. And, you know, I think I, I would encourage folks to monitor um, while it's happening and to make sure that, you know, you can make changes on the fly if things aren't going well. Um, have a forester develop alternative cutting plans. Um, if you have any say in the, in the, um, in the management of the forest lands, um, you know, hire a forester to, to, to um, develop some alternative plans and figure out what the water quality impact of each of those are. Um, do some calculations or modeling before cutting, know what the water quality implications might be. Um, it's really hard to put a tree back on the landscape once it's gone. Um, and there's a recovery period associated with the land um, to, um, to get back to where you were. So um, um, better to do a few calculations ahead of time than, uh, than kind of deal with poor water quality for a period of time afterwards. Um, so our lakes rec probably recovered twice in, uh, in sort of um, uh, New England's history by abandoning the watersheds. You know, by just walking away, um, the forest regrew. That's unlikely to happen the next time. I think a lot of our clearing of the forest, particularly in the southern part of Maine and central Maine, is more related to development now than it is to um, sort of continual logging. Um, and once you put houses on the landscape and neighborhoods, um, it's very unlikely that that's going to revert back to forest anytime soon, unless something, you know, absolutely horrible happens um, in the world, which, you know, is always a possibility, I guess. Um, outright ownership of all or most of a watershed is extremely rare. It's helpful. And, and I work with a couple of watersheds where uh, you know, one family or one group basically owns the whole watershed. And I tell them how rare and, uh, and important that is for them to, to you know, they, they're in charge or they're, they um, have full uh, ability to, to, to uh, control their own future. Um, but that's really rare. Um, so, you know, protection through easement is more common. Um, and I, I would encourage... Um, you know, lake associations to start looking at areas that are critical to their water quality and uh, trying to protect them. Um, the lakes and forests drive much of the means ecology and economy. Um, we need to understand and take care of them individually, but also together. I mean, they are tied together. And um, the forests are really important to the lakes. 
I guarantee the people who work in the forest industry also recreate and live in and around the lakes of, uh, of Maine. Um, and I guarantee that, you know, there are people, um, you know, who are associated with the lakes that appreciate the forest and everybody uses wood and paper. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important that, uh, you know, we kind of work together on these things. Communication is the key, um, especially when you can't do outright protection. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the more that uh, um, groups that have competing interests talk with each other, I think the more likely we can come up with solutions that, that are helpful to both sides. And with that, I will stop. And this is another site from Maine. Um, I will tell you what this one is. This is uh, Lake Umbagog, the main side of it, um, and uh, one of my favorite places. So with that, I can take some questions. Thanks so much, Don. That was a lot of really good information packed into really a short amount of time. <laughs> um, and we do have a few questions. Some of them may, well, I'll do, I'll do a couple quick ones. Um, somebody said their township is in the process of making its master plan and she was really, um, she would wondered if you would be willing to share your slides. Yeah, so I, I sent a copy of the, um, of the slides um, in a PDF format that we could actually send. This okay. is a, it's an enormous, uh, enormous file, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, Drew has that. Okay, we will can definitely get that out to participants. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was sort of, I took some pictures and I was madly taking notes, but that's great, thank you. Yep. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the models that you that were used? Um, I, I sort of hesitate, this is a big question, but, um, well, for, for, well, I'll preface it by saying Maine has a great program called Beginning with Habitat that can help people with the, the mapping. So I was looking at that um, watershed you showed in Keene and uh, Beginning with Habitat came to mind. So I just wanted to let listeners know um, if they're not familiar with Beginning with Habitat to definitely check it out. It's part of the Maine um, Inland Fisheries and Wild Department de um, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. It has great resources mapped. And uh, so that's that's one thing I wanted to make sure people knew about. But then in terms of, yeah, the modeling and how you got those numbers, is there anything without taking another hour? <laughs> yeah, you know? well, I'll, try, I'll, I'll try not to make everyone go tilt. But, uh, you know, for a lot of the watershed planning that I do and, and you know, a bunch of others, um, we use a, a kind of a model uh, called lakes loading response model. Um, and it's very similar to, to some of the models that, um, that Maine DEP uses. Um, and they may in fact use um, LLRM for a lot of the modeling that they do too. Um, I think it's a really good uh, planning tool. It's sort of kind of, uh, you know, it, it doesn't require an enormous amount of data. It does require some data to, to get it going, but um, you know, kind of the power is that you can quickly get to the point where you can run scenarios and figure out, is this gonna be better or worse than that? And so from, from land cover data and some data about um, you know, houses on, around the lake and some waterfall data and things like that, we can figure out on an annual basis how many, you know, what nutrients come into the lake. Um, and then we can also predict sort of what the nutrient concentration would be in the lake, um, what the probability is that you would have an algal bloom what the transparency might be, and how green the lake would be, what the chlorophyll would be. Um, you know, using a bunch of, of equations that have been developed over, over years and years and years, and they're all in the public domain. And the lake loading response model is also in the, in the public doma domain. And, it, you know, it's not something that's meant, was originally meant to, uh, you know, live in an ivory tower. Um, you know, it sort of was, it was originally developed for a, uh, for a class and um, you know, it's become a really good tool. And I think somebody who has a little bit of knowledge of this stuff can, can easily um, run it. And uh, um, so without a lot of effort and, uh, um, or you, they may need some help setting it up and then they can you know, own it from there on. So uh, um, I, think, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I mean, if somebody yeah. wants more information on that, you know, feel free to contact me and I can, uh, I can talk for hours on it. I taught a course that went for two days on it um, a couple of years ago. So, okay, <laughs> great. 
Thank you. Uh, what about sort of um, distance from the lake in terms of obviously the closer you are to a lake, the more impacts logging might have um, just because the water has less distance to travel. That's right. Shorter distance <clears throat> is, you know, is all, but all, you know, we always, we always at Maine Lakes, whenever we're sharing watershed information, we talk about how anything you do in a watershed has, it has the potential to impact the lake. Is there a distance or, um, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I so what I think what I yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, I got a couple, couple different ways of coming at that one. You know, I think if it's near a tributary stream, it's functionally right on the lake. You know, so if even if the stream, the stream could be four miles long, and if you're at the headwaters of that stream, and whatever's happening dumps directly into that stream, functionally you're discharging it directly to the lake. So, you know, it may be out of sight from the lake shore, but it's not out of mind in terms of what the lake sees. Um, and I, I think the other, the other component of that is, um, unless the landscape has areas upstream that can capture sediment and, and you know, meaningfully hold it back for a period of time to allow things to settle out, everywhere in the watershed is, is of importance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in terms of actual distance from open water, I think one of the first things to kind of look for when a logging project is proposed is are they leaving buffers around surface water? You know, streams, tributary streams, are they cutting right up and over the stream, up and over wetlands? Um, up right up to the lake shore, or are they leaving, you know, a large area of buffer um, along those? And that's someplace where, you know, I think you can probably do a lot of good in terms of kind of minimizing the impact of logging by keeping those buffers intact. Um, so, but but you know, everything in the watershed matters, and you know, when we're doing modeling and when we're looking at uh, water quality issues, we look at the whole watershed. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody want, I have a couple more, couple quick other questions for you, but before I, before I ask that, I will make a plug that um, Maine Lakes, there's a program called Forestry for Maine Birds, which was evolved, you know, in, the Maine Forest Service was involved and the Forest, Steward Guild, Forest Stewards Guild and Maine Audubon, they got together and worked on a project called Forestry for Maine Birds, which is, um, you know, sort of getting folks to log ecologically and be thinking about habitat and space for birds uh, when you're logging and um, how you can log and provide bird habitat if you know you can have both and this seems like you know you can definitely have protect water quality and have logging you can't have both but I just wanted to mention real quick that um, we're back in touch and so now um, I was at Maine Audubon before now I'm at Maine Lakes and now we're back in touch with those folks and there is an effort to create a forest for fish uh, program for to really get to landowners and um, help inform landowners about shoreland zoning laws and and all kinds of different things related to forestry and logging and fish including the need to include stream you know really important to include stream so just want to make a plug for forestry for fish. That's that's definitely something that's rolling, um, and we'll be working on. So this talk is really well timed for that because we just had an initial meeting for forestry for fish. So, right, right, um, and, and sort of related to the last question, you know, um, having a, having a buffer around the streams is really really important for fish. Not only because things can see them and and prey on them, but even more importantly. This, it keeps the streams cold if they're if they're shaded. Right. Um, right. So really, really important to have those buffers for that reason as well. Yeah. Yeah. And good thing. I mean, I feel good about Maine shoreland zoning laws, and uh, but they're always under um, they're always under attack, and uh, it's really important for all of us to be paying attention and working to keep them strong. A couple other questions. Somebody asked if there were, and this might be putting you on the spot because it's a main question, but. Um, are there regulations in Maine regarding required steps to be taken following a logging operation to prevent nutrient runoff or really to reduce nutrient runoff? Do you know? I mean, yeah, I know there so, are. 
I, I, I would be really surprised if there was not um, a set of sort of best practices to be to be followed, um, you know, associated with logging. Um, I don't know offhand what they are. Um, in, New, in New Hampshire, there are, you know, best management practices. You know, I think the reality of the situation is there's often few people looking at an individual um, cut or property. Um, and, you know, that's where I think this kind of the volunteer group um, can fill a really important role. And uh, a lake I worked on just, um, just south of where I live had a huge logging operation and they monitored all the streams that were associated with that logging operation. And when things went south, they informed the right people like, hey, I don't know what's going on up there, but it's not working and they need to go and fix what they're doing um, and operate a little differently to make sure that they're not sending, you know, sediment and nutrients downstream into our into our lake. And that's where I think, you know, the vigilance is really important. It's important to be involved in the front end, you know, when these things are proposed to make sure that the safeguards are in place that are, you know, required by law. And, and you know, if you have a good dialogue, um, you know, you can, you can ask for things, um, you know, ask that things be protected. Um, you may or may not get them, but um, um, if they're not required by law, but, but then monitoring afterwards is really, really important. Thanks. Um, I am going to, I was watching the chat and Andy Schultz was weighing in and I was just going to make a plug be, uh, for the, you know, the expertise that our foresters have um, and our loggers have. Um, but I'm going to promote him to um, panelists. And I think Andy, now if you turn on your um, video, you should be allowed to talk. There's Andy. So I was channeling Andy as we, we were talking and, um, you know, he, Andy made some great comments that are in the chat, but um, Andy, you want to just jump in about sort of this, this, this issue? And somebody did ask too, and I think Andy um, might be the good one to answer it. And I think it's important for this audience is just um, if, if, if a landowner is looking for advice, a small pond and maybe steep and a little small area, who, who they should call, so. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's really oh, you're good, good presentation, a lot of excellent points. Uh, I basically agree with, with everything that you said, but I, I do feel you've left the impression that logging cannot happen uh, next to or in the watershed of a lake without damage. And I just want to say that there's a lot of logging goes on, uh, you know, Portland water, uh, the watershed of Sebago Lake. Uh, I've personally been involved in harvest right to the water's edge along drinking water sources in my part of Maine, where to my knowledge, there was zero uh, impact, negative impact on the lake. So just want to say it's, it's not only possible, it happens all the time. But uh, definitely agree that you want good preparation, good planning. I think the best team is a, a good forester and a good logger. And at least in Maine, and I'm certain it's true in New Hampshire as well, there's a lot of loggers who have over the past several decades gotten a lot of training, a lot of education, even changed their equipment um, to be able to really minimize soil disturbance, um, you know, both it's not just the equipment, obviously, it's the person who runs it. So the decisions that are made, um, without a doubt, having people keeping an eye on things is great. Oftentimes that is the job of a consulting forester. In Maine, we have district foresters. In New Hampshire, you have county foresters. I would wager the county foresters are just as um, eager and willing to come take a look at a site ahead mm -hmm. of time as our district foresters to help prep people up on, you know, the risks they have uh, regarding water quality, you know, and the type of management they're going to do. Um, so yes, Maine does have extensive laws. We have, uh, you know, but the old shoreland zoning laws, which were pretty protective and basically uh, developed by our Department of Environmental Protection. But over the past few years, we've been moving towards what we call statewide standards that are administered and enforced by the Maine Forest Service. Uh, there's maps for every town that has adopted those standards that shows uh, different levels of protection. So there's a lot of that information that kind of builds on that beginning with habitat, you know, the mapping you can get there. Um, 
all this is part of good prep for a, a well-planned and well-executed timber harvest. Obviously, clear objectives are very important. Uh, making sure that water quality, maintaining it, protecting is one of those objectives is key. Communication is always key. Um, things can happen quickly with modern logging equipment. So you, it's really the person running that equipment that is the, the real nexus of what goes on. Uh, foresters are there to assist and you know provide oversight, but ultimately it's the, the person at the controls of either the the skidder, the harvester, the forwarder, what have you, um, working with whoever's doing the, the prep and layout. Uh, we've got, um, I wanted to, I got it in the chat. I want to men mention our best management practices for protecting water quality booklet. And there's web pages to go with that. Uh, somebody asked what, what's a BMP? So I wanted to make sure that that got answered. A BMP is a best management practice and almost universally, they refer to practices that protect water quality and at the same time prevent soil movement because those two things go together. So maybe I'll just stop there <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Andy. So, so I was hoping there would be a forester on, on, on the call. Call and uh, you know, very th thankful that you, uh, you you spoke up and um, those are great comments and I don't want to give the impression that that you know logging can never happen in a, in a lake watershed. Um, I think there's ways to do it carefully and and um, and you know make everybody happy and uh, I don't want to leave you with the impression that and there are times you know when when it's probably advantageous to to at least do some forest management to uh, to make the the sand healthier and I. I Totally agree um, with um, with the points you made, and uh, thank you very much for bringing them up. Great, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so I think we're kind of, we're coming up on five o'clock. So I think there are a couple more questions that we can, but we'll we'll follow up with people individually. We'll keep the questions and follow up with individuals. Just in the interest of time, we always see people fall off pretty quickly at five. So. In the interest of time, I'll end it there and say thanks to Don for great presentation and good information. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. And remember, you can watch the recording. We'll have it on our website. Uh, so if you want to share it with someone who wasn't able to join us today, please pass it on. Thanks very much. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, thanks everybody. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Andy.